Well, so glad to be with you this morning, and if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn to Luke chapter 14 this morning. Whatever form of Bible you have, iPhone, iPad, leather-bound, whatever it might be, Luke chapter 14. Today we're in uh, the last message of our Havoc series, which is part of the overall series that we call the Jesus series, going through the book of Luke. We'll actually walk through Luke until we get to Easter Sunday morning, which is about the resurrection. And uh, we, we hopefully, as we keep moving that way, we'll end up just at that point on Easter Sunday morning. By the way, learning about the life of Jesus is the most important thing you can ever do in your lifetime. Because he is our leader, he is our king, he's the one we follow, and uh, he is everything. And so you want to know everything you can about the life of Jesus. By the way, uh, next Sunday night, our mission conference, I need to also say this, that uh, you don't want to miss uh, Richard Taylor as he comes to preach. He preached for me back in June. I remember watching online. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. The time change allowed me to be a part of the service. And, and I mean, the room was electric. You guys loved him when he came and he preached, and you're going to love it when he comes back next Sunday morning. Then next Sunday night, we're having a what's called a what's next meeting. That what's next meeting will take place both on Sunday night and Wednesday night of next week. Um, and they are identical meetings designed to kind of clue you in to what the Long Range Vision team has been discussing. We'll talk about such things as Campus West, refurbishing the facilities here, a satellite campus, a number of things like that that we are considering in the days ahead. So I want you to be there uh, next Sunday night as well, and then the following Wednesday night, again, identical meetings designed to uh, get collaborative input and for us to share some things about that with you. Luke chapter 14, uh, beginning of verse 16, this is about the havoc of the heart. Now when Jesus began moving forward and teaching, he, he saw a lot of opposition. This section of Luke is about all the opposition, all the conflict, all the storms, and literally the hurricanes that came from every direction, not only from spiritual opposition, but also religious opposition, cultural opposition, and now today, heart opposition. Because when Jesus calls us to this life he wants us to live, there's always havoc in the heart before we make the decision to follow. Some time ago, my wife and I traveled to Denver, Colorado, where I have a son. My son Joshua lives there. And uh, has been living there since January when he got a job there at a great corporation. And he loves living in Colorado. Joshua loves climbing mountains. He loves uh, riding four-wheel drive through uh, all those paths out there. He loves the mountains especially, though, because he was raised uh, in Texas primarily. In Texas, the largest mountain we have is the landfill just a few miles down to the south here. That's all we have in the way of mountains. But when you go to Colorado, uh, the tops of the mountains are a different color. They're white. They actually have snow on them. And, and we went hiking with him uh, earlier this summer, and we went up to a place called St. Mary's Glacier. Man, it's a beautiful place. It's really where the glacier uh, has made its way down the mountainside. And at the base of that glacier is a beautiful crystal clear lake that is freezing water. I mean, it's cold, no ice on top, but very, very cold water. And there are cliffs around uh, that place where that lake is on Lake Mary's Glacier. So we climb up there with him, or hike is a better word for it. And when we get to the, uh, the place where the lake is, there's a mountain on the other side of the lake. There's a cliff, and a few people have climbed up to the top of the cliff, and they've jumped off into the lake. Now, this cliff is between 50 and 75 feet above the lake, so it's quite a sizable jump. And uh, Josh says to me, you want to go jump? And I, of course, say, of course, right, yes. I mean, this is the guy challenge. Son says to dad, I'm willing to do it. Are you willing to do it? And dad will never, ever, ever back down. Even when I'm 80, I'm going to take that challenge, right? I'm going to take that challenge. So we, we climb up, and there's a group of people watching us, and uh, he gets up to the, to the precipice, the edge there, and looks down. I'm behind him, and he's going to jump first. And uh, so he actually is almost ready to jump, and we look up, and we see um, this thing in the sky, and it's got a camera on it, and somebody down here has one of these little flying things. What do we call them? I'm lost, at a loss for words. You, you all said it. There it is. And uh, so it's hovering above us right there, and it's getting this beautiful picture of us shaking in our shorts up there, right? So, so here we are, and this thing's watching us and filming us, and Josh jumps off. And he gets into the water, and he gets out, and then it's my turn. And I have to admit... Uh, uh, 
for a moment. Don't tell anybody, but I was scared for just a moment, right? <laughs> Paralyzed is a good word for it. <laughs> I'm standing there and I'm looking down to the waters crystal clear and I can, I can see some things like, for example, rocks beneath the surface of the water. That gives me pause. And then I think, well, no, I could probably clear the rock. So I look for skeletons just to make sure, right? So <laughs> no skeletons, no fish, no sharks, nothing like that. Just some rocks. I think I can clear that. And uh, then I began to think about the fact that why did I even say yes to this stupid idea? <laughs> he invited me to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's the guy thing in you that makes you want to say yeah. It's the competition thing. So I'm there. But now it's time. And it's a whole different picture, right? This is the second invitation because he's down there in the water saying, come on. And time is ticking, right? The clock is ticking. So the longer I wait, the more embarrassing it is. And finally, I take the leap, right? And I have to say, if the fall hadn't have killed me, which it didn't, the freezing water would have. And it was really, really cold. But I made it, got it out of the water. We got this beautiful 4K camera shot of this leap off this cliff. But what I want to say that story to you for, the reason I want to share the story is because this is the kind of leap that Christ is asking people to make. You have to leave behind the stability of something that's more rock solid in your mind. You have to take a leap into something that's very unknown. There's an invitation given and we first say yes, but then when it comes time to actually leap, we have paralysis and second thoughts. That's what's happening in Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, verse 15, we have the religious leaders saying, we're going to be part of your kingdom. Jesus is talking about kingdom. He's the king. He's making this invitation. Now, these Pharisees are saying, we're part of that kingdom. When, when the king comes, we'll be part of that kingdom. Now, they have not yet acknowledged that Jesus is the king. And he's about to share with them, you might have another thought coming. You probably are not going to be a part of that kingdom because the invitation is being extended and you're telling me no. So I want us to stand for just a moment. I want us to read the passage beginning in verse 16 of Luke 14. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slaves to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. Part of the twofold invitation. There's the invitation that has been given previously. We're going to have a dinner, a banquet. And they've said yes. But now the second invitation, come now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. And I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you've commanded has been done, and there is still room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them, compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited, that is previously invited, shall taste of my dinner. Father, today as we talk about this parable and the havoc of the heart that was taking place in those of that day, my prayer is that we will also experience havoc in our heart. We are supposed to struggle with this call. We are supposed to wrestle with the demands you make of the kingdom on our lives. And Father, I pray that you'll give us direction as we do this. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Many of you are on that cliff, the spiritual cliff, not the physical one. You're on the precipice. You're, um, you're one of those that have said yes to Jesus generally. And now he says, come now and you're in paralysis. You're in paralysis because now it takes something beyond a yes verbal answer. You're in paralysis because you have to leave the security of the rock you've been standing on, whatever that is. However unstable it is, however sharp the edges are, however much difficulty you've been experiencing, you're at the edge of that, and everything you've experienced is solid, and he's asking you to jump out 
into space for something more solid, but something you haven't experienced yet. That's where the Jews were. In fact, this is probably the key moment in the life of the Jewish people who have said that they were looking for a king and a kingdom. They've said they are looking for a Messiah. And now Jesus is saying, you've been given an invitation. You originally said you were coming, but now, now I'm saying it's time for the dinner. And you're saying, I've got other things to do. Wow. This is a part of the kingdom parables where Jesus is teaching people about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has two aspects to it. Every time Jesus teaches about it, the kingdom has a here and now aspect, which means that the kingdom of God is in your heart where the reign of Christ is Lord, where Jesus is leading the way. That's where the kingdom of God is present in your life. But the kingdom of God is also a future promise where the kingdom is total, it's complete, where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And those who do not do that will be relegated into a place of separation. We call it hell. It's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of death, the kingdom of hell, and the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is making this kingdom invite, and the Jews have begun now to say no. I want you to notice some things about this parable. First of all, the invitation. In verse 16 and 17, he had a big dinner. He invited many. At that dinner, he sent a slave to say to everyone who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. Pretty big deal. And it's this analogy of Jesus and the kingdom of God. He invites people. The larger picture is of his forever reign, his eternal reign. The briefer picture is you're invited to come and participate, but not only to participate, but to serve as well. You see, every kingdom invite not only has an amazing benefit, amazing privileges, but also responsibilities. All it takes for us to see that is to jump ahead a little bit. For example, if you jump ahead to Luke chapter 14 and verse 26 and 27, Here's what you read. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters yet, even his own life, he cannot be not my disciple. The word hatred there means disembrace. It means you choose to follow Christ when it comes in conflict with brothers or sisters or mothers and fathers. Your allegiance is to this king, to Christ. Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So the invitation is given, but the response is not automatic. It's difficult to follow Christ. It's a banquet, but it also involves citizens of the kingdom and their responsibilities that you have. It's a call to Christ's lordship. It's a call to let the king be the master of your life. And I think it's very important that we clarify for those of us living in this age 2,000 years later who have somehow gotten the idea that saying yes to Jesus only means saying yes. Saying yes to Jesus doesn't mean just simply saying yes. It means saying yes to his future demands. I didn't know everything about what Christ was going to call me to do when I first said yes to Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, but Ultimately, lordship is about saying yes to every other thing he asks of you as you learn about it. If I had known that Christ was going to call me to be a pastor when I was six years old, I don't know that I would have said yes. <laughs> if I had known that someday I would be tempted by sin in a powerful way and I would need to die to self in order to say yes to Christ, I don't know if I would have said yes at six. I didn't understand those things at six years old. Just like some don't understand at age 25 all that that Christian life means. But saying yes truly to the King and to Jesus means I'm saying yes to everything you will ever call me to do because you're King and this is the kingdom and you rule in my life, and you reign in my life. I want there to be clarity about the invitation today. It's not just an invite to a big meal. It's not just a picnic. The picnic is part of the life that Christ calls us to have. Now, having said all that, I look back on my Christian life, and I see nothing but benefit, nothing but joy, nothing but excitement. Even though some of those things Christ has called me to are difficult and, and, and hard to deal with, sometimes it's excruciating what we go through in order to say yes to Jesus. But I look back and I say I regret none of those steps that led me to follow Jesus all the way. Are you with me this morning? There needs to be clarity in the call of the kingdom. It's a big deal. 
So there's an invitation. Then there's a rejection. It's very clear that the parable is about the fact that many began to make excuses. Look at verse 18. But they all began to make excuses. Now, you need to know something about the culture of that day. When a banquet was held, uh, there, were, there were two parts to the invitation. There was a save the date, so to speak, so that you would clear your calendar and the host would know, okay, these people are coming. They've said yes, they've saved the day. So we're going to do everything we can to bring this huge banquet together. All the food will be prepared. All the things that have to take place will be taken care of for this number of guests that have saved the day. Then there is the time when the dinner is ready and the, the, the man sends out the servants to say, now it's time to come this moment. The meal is ready. It's time to eat. So this twofold invitation was very normal in that day for a banquet. Each of the guests in this parable had already agreed to attend the banquet. The host expected them to be there. And yet when he says it's time to come, verse 18 says they all began to make excuses. Now this is a really revealing word. This word excuses is revealing. The word itself means to beg to be released. It's the idea of not wishing to offend the one that invited them. I don't want you to be upset at me, but I'm not coming. And I'm begging you to let me out of that promise to come. This is the text, by the way, that was the last message preached by D.O. Moody, a very famous preacher years and years ago. In fact, this last message was preached on November 23rd, 1899, and the title of the message was Excuses. He was uh, very ill. He was preaching it in St. Louis in a convention center. He was so worn out that he had to lean on an organ there in order to keep from falling over. He said, I have souls that I must be saved here. And he said, never, never have I wanted so much to lead men and women to Christ as I do right now at this time. There was a pain in his chest and a, a pulse that was way beyond what it should have been. He preached the message. He immediately went home and died 30 days later just simply from all those ailments that he had. It was his last message. and It was titled, entitled Excuses. And I, I mention that to you because that's what's happening here. They all began to make excuses to not follow this king. And they had all kinds of excuses. They're paralyzed, they're frozen, they're unwilling to leave their good for something greater. It's interesting that when they make this response, nobody's saying no outright. Nobody's saying uh, absolutely not. They're just simply saying, I know I said yes, but right now there are other things that demand my attention, other things that I think are more important than coming to this dinner. And as the parable un unfolds, there are three particular kinds of statements that are made. And they correspond very well with three things that we struggle with today. You don't have to stretch the parable at all to impact what we deal with on a day by day that keeps us sometimes from following Jesus day by day or following Jesus at all. So I want you to notice these three things with me as we walk through this text. And by the way, this is one of those messages that we'll struggle with. I'll struggle with it and you will struggle with it. It's a wrestling match. It's not a wrestling match between me and you. It's a wrestling match between you and God. Between you and Scripture, not wrestling God is not a bad thing. You're not going to win the match. You may limp as a result of that, but at the end you will have known who is Lord, whether it's him or you. So I know that this text will be uncomfortable. And I know that it will be pointed. And I know that it will cause us to wonder and ask questions about our lives. And let me just say, if you're asking questions about your life, you're in the right place. If you're asking those questions in an honest way and you want the Holy Spirit to reveal to you exactly where you stand on this invitation that Christ gives to you to let him be Lord and King and Savior of your life, you're doing what you should be doing today. You should be wrestling. You should be sweating. You should be working this through just a little bit, at least. Three things. The first response says basically this, my possessions leave me conflicted. My possessions leave me conflicted. Verse 18, they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Now, this is actually a ludicrous response 
because they can look at that land anytime they want to. So it's kind of a crazy response. And we'll look at why that is in just a few moments. But it deals with their possessions. I guess you know this, but many allow their possessions to keep them from focusing on Christ. I need to be quick to say that the root of all evil is not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. I need to tell you today that riches have a certain deceitfulness to them. They can draw you in. And at some point, many possessions that we have can possess us. At some point, they demand more time, more attention, more upkeep than we ever dreamed they might demand of our lives. And at some point, we look back and say, I am dominated by the things I have or the things I want to have or by paying for the things I thought I needed to have. And those things begin to dominate our lives even to the point where they keep us from fully following Christ on a day-by-day basis. And this is a common thing. Now, I'm very aware that I'm preaching to a group of people living in 21st century America. We are the most materialistic nation on the face of the earth in the history of the world. We have more than anyone has ever had in all of humanity. That's what we deal with on a day-by-day basis. But it's not about what we have or how much we have. It's how much are our possessions holding us back from following Christ fully? You can't live for riches and live for him at the same time. You can't serve both God and mammon, Jesus says. You've got to choose. Probably one of the most uh, famous stories in the Bible, a great conversation that took place between Jesus Christ and this young man whom we know as a rich young ruler. If you remember the story of Matthew 19, Jesus has a conversation with this man who actually initiates the conversation. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I want to know, how do I make myself right with God? How am I going to have eternal life forever and ever? And Jesus looked at him and looked at his life and knew what was in his heart and said, one thing you need to do, you need to go and sell all that you have and give that to the poor and come and follow me. And his face fell because he had many things, the Bible says. And you know what's interesting about that conversation is that Jesus did not resolve it. Jesus did not say, oh, it's okay. You don't have to sell everything. Just sell some of those things and then come and follow me. You don't find that kind of conclusion there. We don't know whether this man followed Jesus or not. Some say that later on he did, but we don't know that. All we know is that this man's face fell. He was grieved in heart because he knew that his possessions possessed him. Now, Jesus didn't say that to everybody. He didn't tell everyone who wanted to follow him, you've got to sell all that you have and give it to the poor and follow me. Why did he not do that? Because this young man was possessed by his possessions and not everybody else is. So we have an example in the Bible of someone who said to an invite by the Messiah himself, "Mm, I don't know that I'm going to sell my possessions and give them to the poor and follow you. What Jesus did was reveal his heart. And I repeat again, you cannot live for riches and live for Christ at the same time. Your possessions cannot possess you. You can have them, but they cannot possess your heart and your life and your attention and your focus when Jesus is calling to you you to something higher. Secondly, my work leaves me conflicted. Look in verse 19, and another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another ludicrous response. These oxen that he's bought are going to be there tomorrow. They're going to be there the next day. And yet the the excuse is used. I've got to go try these oxen out. Now, I've never tried oxen out. I don't know what oxen are like when you try them out, but they can't be more appealing than than the banquet table that's prepared for these individuals that Jesus gives. So again, Jesus is giving us an amazingly crazy and and simple and ludicrous response to an amazing kingdom invite. And essentially, it's just like people who are saying, I am just not interested in building his kingdom. My focus is on mine. How would I have time to follow him everywhere? How would I have the energy to follow him everywhere? Or people that feel that their work compromises them morally or ethically and they struggle to choose work over being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. My work leaves me conflicted. I can't tell you the number of times I've had people come to me and say, I like following Christ, but I have found that I can't be a true Christian and continue to work where I'm working. I said, why? 
because I'm asked to lie, I'm asked to steal, I'm asked to cheat, I'm asked to deceive, and I struggle with that. And my response is always, I am so glad to hear you say you struggle with that. Because if you were able to do that without remorse, if you were able to do that without conscience, then I would say you need to consider whether you've ever really given your life to Christ or not. So the struggle is real. It's very much a present thing in many kinds of professions. But here's the statement that we need to see. You can't live for your work and live for Jesus. You must choose who you're going to be loyal to. Then there's a third response, and the third response has to do with relationships. My relationships leave me conflicted. Verse 20, another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And let me just say this about relationships. It's very important that we understand why the Scripture calls us consistently to be only yoked with other believers who align themselves with Christ as we do. I can't tell you how frequently we, this comes up in Scripture. I was preaching a few weeks ago in Malachi uh, in the state of Georgia in a particular church, and we were walking through the entire book of Malachi. And, and in that day, Malachi's day, the people of God had intermarried with those who worshipped foreign gods. And, and the problem was large. It was beginning to compromise the worship of the people of God. Or you think about Solomon, the wisest man in all the world at one point, who later on in his life, married so many brides and had so many concubines that the foreign gods they worship led the heart of Solomon away from the true God. And let me just say, that's why Scripture says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers because as we walk with unbelievers or those who do not have allegiance to Christ or those who get in the way of our allegiance to Christ, we compromise the response to an amazing invitation to follow Christ fully with all of our hearts. And this is one of the reasons, as Jesus said in the passage we looked at a few moments ago, you've got to be willing to hate all else in order to follow me, to disembrace all others in order to obey me. One of my favorite guys in this church is Felix Cervantes. I don't even know if he's in the room today. He may be in another part of our service, but Felix uh, came to Christ a few years ago in a conversation we had just out in the parking lot here. And Felix... Uh, heard about the Christian life and knew what he needed to do next and baptism was next for him. And I remember a conversation with Felix where he said, you know, I'm really concerned about my relatives, my, my parents, my grandparents, all raised staunch Catholic. And I know that when I profess my faith in Christ and baptized again, I know that might be a problem. I know it might be, might be difficult for them to handle. It might be difficult for me to handle that with them. And, and he voiced his concerns and it's a very real concern very real concern. And then he yet came to the decision and said, I'm going to do this anyway because it's Christ that caused me to do this. And I still remember the day we baptized Felix. His parents and grandparents were in the baptistry with us when he was baptized. They actually came and stood behind us back there. And it's amazing how that all worked out. But Felix had a decision to make in this following of Christ and letting Christ be Lord and King and Master. And that is, I've got to choose between my family members sometime and following Christ, but I'm going to choose Christ. That's how it plays out on a day-by-day -day basis. You can't live for your relationships instead of living for Jesus. You've got to choose. Now, having said that, let me just say, once you make a choice to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's incredible and amazing how your relationships begin to align with you because you're leading the way to follow Christ wholeheartedly. But that's the third struggle. Now, John MacArthur in his commentary about these kinds of responses is very interesting. He says these are lame excuses, but that's the point. He says the point is these are laughable excuses for a reason. The extravagance of the banquet is contrasted with the weakness of, of the excuses. The truth is there's no real reason to say no to the King of kings and Lord of lords. There's no reason that we should have in our lives where we say, Jesus, I realize who you are, what you're calling us to, the life that you promised us, the eternity we're going to be given. There's no reason for us to say there's something on earth holding us back. When we're standing at that precipice about whether we're going to follow Christ or not, whether we're going to leap or not, nothing back here is more stable. Nothing is more valuable than Christ himself. It's not just about heaven. It's not just about eternal life. It's about life forever, year after year, millennial after millennium, worth Christ himself. It's an amazing thing that Jesus, God the Son, invites us to. 
We have to look at that through the perspectives of the value of the invitation because when we see the value of the invitation, everything that would hold us back is laughable. I've got some acreage of land. I've got to go look at it. I can't come. I've got five oxen. I've got to try them out. I can't come. I've married a wife. I've got to stay there. I can't come. As important as possessions are, as important as work is, as important as relationships are, Jesus is preeminent. I just want you to think about this for just a minute. What have you been invited to? How willingly have you said yes? So you have this amazing thing taking place. And then in this parable, one more thing unfolds. God's character is displayed. I want you to see how in this parable, we see the character of God unfolding with these responses. Verse 21, and the slave came back and reported this to the master and the head of the household became angry. So here you have Jesus telling a story about the master being angry and we see God's character on display. First of all, we see God's wrath and justice. He became angry and that's a really, really strong word in the original language and essentially it leads us to believe we don't know where the line is. We don't know where God's mercy and his graciousness ceases to be there, but we know there is a line drawn. At one point he will say, I've invited you and you have not responded. I'm moving on. We don't think a lot about God having character like that, but that's who God is. Jump back to chapter 13 for just a moment. Let me show you something interesting here. This part of the kingdom parable teaching. Verse 34, Jesus has made this offer to the Jews and guess what they say? They say, nope, not coming. The parable is actually about them as well. So in verse 34, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. And then he says, behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now jump to verse 24, verse 14. He's saying the same thing of chapter 14. He says, for I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste of my dinner, the wrath of God, the justice of God, the drawing of the lines, the character of God says, I've made an invitation to you and you've turned it down. Now at this moment in the service, there ought to be a real quiet, sober spirit where we're thinking through, have I turned him down for anything he's called me to do? Have I turned him down for the offer for salvation? Have I said something else is holding me back? I'm not going to follow Christ. Have I stood on that precipice and decided not to jump because I like the stability of what I'm familiar with instead of the unknown of what he's going to call me to? Have I said yes to him as Savior, but no to him as Lord? It's an important moment to think about that. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, an amazing verse that talks about the character of God. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. There's something about how God works with us where it's very, very loud and present. His voice is very obvious at first, but as we say no, his voice begins to diminish and we hear him less and less and less. And at some point we go, is he even still there? And he's there. And he's made the invitation, but maybe you haven't said yes. His wrath and his justice, but then also you see his character displayed in his mercy and his grace one more time. Look at verse 22. He says, as a result of all this, go out now into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Go out to the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in. I love this part of God's character. God says, I've made the invitation and, and many did not come. So here's what I want to do. I want to make sure that everybody, know how, no matter how far away they are from this conversation, no matter how far away they are from me, I want them to know, and I want them to be invited, and I want them to be compelled to come in. So you're going to have to encourage them because they are unknown. Nobody knows who they are. It's an unexpected invitation. They're not looking for it. They're unprepared to leave everything, but go and compel them and tell them about my grace and tell them about my mercy and tell them about my invitation to the banquet table and to the kingdom. That's why we go and tell people about Christ. 
Now, let me tell you who you are in this picture. Not who you are in the first part of the picture, but who you are in the last part of the picture. You and I are not those Jews who originally received the kingdom offer. But we are those who are out there in the highways and the hedges of life. Unless there are some of us in this room who are literally Jewish, we're not part of that group. We're part of the Gentile group. We're part of the group that has been left out until Jesus turns and goes and says, I want all to be able to come. Someone has gone to the highways and hedges and told you and I about Christ. Someone has issued an invitation to us to be able to be at this banquet table. And at this moment, Jesus literally turns from the Jews and looks to the Gentiles, that is all of us, and says, I want you to come. This, this picture of grace is the recipient of God pouring out his grace on all of us. We are the recipient of his grace. John chapter one, verse 11, 12, is a verse that I want to share here at the end. It's one of those great verses that tell us so much about why things are as they are. In verse 11, it says, He came to his own, that would be his own people, the Jewish people. And those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Wow. I love the picture that paints for us today. He came to his own, his own did not receive him, but as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. All the benefits, all the blessings, all the responsibilities of following Jesus as Lord and Savior extended to us today. And the only way to enter in is to receive him as King and Lord and Savior, to say yes to the invitation to jump. You're at the precipice. It's the call to jump. You know, back in 1978, I started dating Kim Hawkins. That was her maiden name. She's now Kim Metter. And uh, there was a time after we dated where it became obvious to me that we were moving towards marriage. She helped me know we were moving towards marriage. <laughs> and I agreed with that. And... At one point, I went to her home on the weekend. She lived in Irving, Texas, and I lived in Oklahoma at the time, and it was during the summer. And I uh, drove down to her house, and I had a ring that she had picked out, and I'd set aside in the way of uh, layaway, they called it. <laughs> layaway. That means $25 a week until the ring's paid for, right? And so all that was going on for a long period of time until it was finally paid off, and that summer I paid it off, and she got in the car and drove down for a weekend in her parents' home. And at some point, after everything had been fully prepared, I kind of knew the answer was yes. Like, you don't ask someone to marry you unless you think the answer is kind of yes, right? You don't, you don't really, like, get an arena and ask somebody that's not really, truly going to say yes. You're not going to get on a knee in front of 20,000 people. So the truth is you don't ever ask anybody to marry you unless you're pretty sure they're going to do it, right? So the invitation was first extended, Yes. This is the ring I like. I'll be engaged to you. But not till I sat down and got down on one knee and said, will you marry me? Did she have a decision to make? At that point, she was on the precipice. At that point, she had a cliff to jump off of. She had to jump off that cliff of stability of her home, stability of where she had lived all of her life. She had to think about leaving her father and mother. She had to think about all those things that a young lady has to think about. She had to think about whether she was going to follow me and live with me. I mean, I was 19 or 20 years old at the time. I wouldn't have blamed her for saying no, honestly. But she said yes. Somebody say amen. I'm saying amen. She said yes. <laughs> Still the best question I've ever popped in my life. Still the best yes I've ever heard in my life. But she was not going to be my wife until I asked that question and until she said yes. Now, she didn't know everything about what was going to hit us in life. We had no idea we were going to have six kids. Who even thinks about that in a premeditated way, really, right? <laughs> she didn't know I was going to be called into ministry. I mean, nobody actually kind of plans that out either, not really. There are a lot of things we've experienced that have been really difficult and a lot of things that will be really, really joyful, really exciting, really fun. But when she said yes, she said yes to whatever might come, almost, 
almost beyond our imaginations, whatever would come, that yes was a yes for that. And my asking her was an invitation that I would say yes to her through all that as well. You know, lordship is kind of like that. Lordship with Christ is a lot like that. He says, will you marry me? And the yes can't be flippant. It can't be, oh yeah, sure. It has to be one of those that says, I will follow you through whatever. Even those things I don't know about yet. And let me suggest today, if you've not said yes to Jesus in that way, then you've not really said yes to Jesus at all. And today it's important for you to consider that a kingdom offer has been made to you by the king, just like at this banquet. And you need to say yes to him. And maybe the first thing you think about is your possessions. Maybe you think about your work. Maybe you think about relationships and what people will think. But what I want you to think about for a few moments is the value of the invitation and the value of the kingdom and the identity of the one that says, will you marry me? He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I want you to stand with me for just a moment. And I'm going to ask our prayer counselors to come to the front. And I've asked us to do something a little different this morning. I want us to not leave. I want us to not close the service right now. But I want to give you an invite. Now, this is more specific than a general invite. These who are standing here today are going to be standing here waiting and willing for you to come and talk to them about saying yes to this invitation from Jesus. He invites you to fully give your life to Him, to let Him be Lord and Savior. And we're going to have Andy sing this song, and I'm calling you to say yes to Jesus today. You've thought through this. Maybe you've wrestled through the passage. Maybe you've wrestled through the text. And whether you've ever made that decision today, you should be able to leave knowing you've made it. Leave without doubt. These next few moments, I want you to join us as we sing. And just walk down the aisle. Just take a hand and say, I'm saying yes to Jesus, completely yes to Jesus today.